Welcome to Draw Studio. Today we're going to learn about the parts of the skeleton and the landmarks we can see from the surface. Let's get started. Understanding the skeleton is important to drawing the figure because it is the literal armature that holds us up and is the structures that our anatomy attaches to. Understanding it in the simplest terms helps us make a structural drawing, and understanding where the bony landmarks can be seen on the surface helps us have x-ray vision and find the solid skeleton underneath. Let's name all the parts of the skeleton. The skull is the name for our head, but we will name all the individual parts later. The clavicle is our collarbone. It connects to our scapula on the back, which is our shoulder blade. The humerus is our upper arm bone, connecting to the scapula. The radius and ulna are the two lower arm bones, and the radius connects to the hand below. The sternum is our breastbone, and where the clavicles attach. The sternum is in the center of our rib cage, which is the solid structure in the upper torso that protects our heart and lungs. Our spine is the central core of our body, made up of individual vertebra. At the bottom of the spine is our sacrum. Attached to the sacrum is the large bowl-like pelvis. Our upper leg bone is the femur, attaching to the pelvis. Our kneecap is called the patella. The tibia is the big bone in the lower leg, and the fibula is the smaller bone in the lower leg and these both connect to the foot below. Now let's look at all these parts more closely. The skull is made up of many parts. The cranium is the round cavity that protects our brain. The brow ridge is the protrusion above our eyes. The flatter middle section between the brow ridge is the glabella. Below the glabella is the top of our nasal bone. The parts of the nose beyond this are all cartilage. As the brow ridge moves to the side of the head, it becomes the eye socket and the eye socket curves back, creating the zygomatic arch. Below the eye socket is what we call our cheekbone. The upper jaw is called the maxilla, and the lower jaw is called the mandible. Behind the mandible on the bottom of the cranium is a hard bump called the mastoid process. We also have a small horseshoe-shaped bone floating in our throat called the hyoid bone. Our spinal column is broken down into three sections. The next section is called the cervical vertebra, and there are seven, labeled C1 through C7. The section that our ribs attach to is the thoracic, and there are 12 vertebra, numbered T1 through T12. The lowest section is the lumbar. There are five vertebra, named L1 through L5. The sacrum is a series of fused vertebra, creating a solid attachment for the pelvis. At the very bottom is our tailbone, called the coccyx. The rib cage is made up of 10 true ribs. True ribs all connect to the sternum on the front of the rib cage. And there are two floating ribs at the bottom of the rib cage that do not connect around to the front, but float at the bottom giving a little extra protection. This means there are 12 ribs on each side for a total of 24 ribs. The true ribs connect to the sternum through a section of cartilage, which is more flexible than bone and allows the rib cage to fluctuate when we breathe. At the bottom of the sternum is a small point that sticks out called the xiphoid process. The opening on the front of the rib cage is the thoracic arch. This wide notch allows us to have more flexibility in our torso. The top of the thoracic arch lands at the sixth rib. The widest part of the rib cage is low, about the eighth rib. The rib cage is overall egg shaped, but because the ribs angle down at the top, and tuck under at the bottom, the rib cage will appear smaller from the front than the back. The clavicle and scapula are a complex structure that hold our arm to our body. The clavicle anchors at our sternum and curves back to meet a hook-shaped structure called the acromion process. This hook is part of a ridge called the spine of the scapula. On the underside of the scapula is a small beak shape called the coracoid process. The humerus attaches to the scapula with a shallow ball and socket joint. This whole structure is called the shoulder girdle, and all of it attaches to the sternum at the pit of the neck. The rest is able to float around held down by tendons and muscles. This gives our arm and shoulders a great range of motion and flexibility. At the bottom of the humerus are two small round protrusions. 
The one towards the outside is the lateral epicondyle, and the inner one is the medial epicondyle. The ulna is the bone that connects to the humerus via a strong hinge joint. The point where it connects has a large bump called the olecranon process, which is our elbow. The ulna is thick near the elbow and gets thinner towards the end. The radius starts at the ulna below the humerus. It is thin at the top and gets thicker towards the end. It radiates or pivots around the ulna. The hand connects to the radius at the carpal mass, which is a series of small bones that make up our wrist. The word meta means beyond in Latin, and so the metacarpals are beyond the carpal mass and make up the body of the hand. The phalanges are the digits of our fingers. There are three phalanges for each finger and two for the thumb. The pelvis is a complex organic structure. It is made of two large wings connecting to the sacrum called ilium. The ilium meet at a point on the front of the pelvis called the pubis symphysis. On the top edge of the ilium is a thick ridge called the iliac crest. At the end of the iliac crest is a distinct point called the anterior superior iliac spine. Anterior means front, superior means above, and iliac spine means a bump on the ilium. There is also a front bump on the ilium just below the anterior superior iliac spine. It is called the anterior inferior iliac spine, inferior meaning below. As the iliac crest wraps around the back of the pelvis, it creates an iliac spine on the back called the posterior superior iliac spine, posterior meaning back. Oftentimes in anatomy, if they take the time to say this is the bigger one, that means there's a smaller one. Or if there's a front one, there's probably a back one. So learning what the Latin means helps us understand what the anatomy is and where we can find it. The ilium extends down the back on either side and turns into a thick round shape called the ischium, which curves forward and meets the pubis symphysis. The ischium are the bones that we sit on. Our femur connects into a deep socket on the side of the ilium. On top of the femur, there is a large rough protrusion called the great trochanter that aids in muscle attachment. At the bottom of the femur are two large round sections called the medial condyle for the inner one and the lateral condyle for the outer one. On the front we have our kneecap called the patella, which creates protection for the leg joint and leverage for our muscle attachments. Below is the large bone of the lower leg called the tibia. Connected to the tibia is a thin bone called the fibula, which creates more surface area for muscle attachments. This combination allows us to have two smaller bones that are lighter instead of one big heavy bone. To remember which one is which, I like to think of the tibia as a big strong word like tibia and fibula as a little small word like fibula. Creating your own little associations with all of these anatomical terms will help you memorize them. The bottom of the tibia and fibula extend down and grip to the ankle bones, which are called the tarsal mass. The tarsal mass is made up of many bones, but an important one is the calcaneus, which is our large heel bone that sticks out, providing balance and strong muscle attachment. The long bones beyond the tarsal mass are called the metatarsals, and like the fingers, we have phalanges that make up the digits of our toes. Now that we know the parts of the skeleton, Let's look at which of them can be seen on the surface. Nearly the whole clavicle can be seen on the surface, along with a flat point for the acromion process. The sternum appears as a flat area running in between the chest muscles. The curve of the thoracic arch is visible from the surface. The medial epicondyle of the humerus sticks out and creates a gentle point we can see. The iliac crest and the anterior superior iliac spine can be seen on the front of the pelvis. The great trochanter usually appears as a gentle depression as the gluteal muscles attach around it. The pubis symphysis appears mostly on the female form as the bottom point of the pelvis from the front. The seventh cervical vertebra is a clear point on the back of the neck and marks the end of the cervical and beginning of the thoracic vertebra. The spine of the scapula and the inner border are both seen as ridges or dimples because of a complex series of muscles that will attach all along these points.
A depression in the lower center of the back indicates the lumbar vertebra underneath. The posterior superior iliac spines will often be shallow dimples, and the bottom of the sacrum is right at the start of the gluteal cleavage. These three landmarks create a triangular shape on the back of the pelvis. On the back of the arm, the olecranon process of the ulna makes a clear hard point. This is our elbow. Below, the ulna forms a long line where muscles attach on either side. This creates a shallow depression called the ulnar furrow. We can also see the end of the ulna as a small bump at the base of the hand on the pinky side. This means we can locate the ulna from the surface, which will greatly aid in drawing the lower arm. When the leg is bent, we occasionally see the condyles of the femur as bumps on the surface. The patella will be a pronounced bone from the front. Just below the knee on the upper part of the tibia is a small bump called the nose of the tibia. The front edge of the tibia is visible as a long straight line commonly called our shin bone. The bottom of the tibia is also seen on the inside of the ankle as a large round bump. The head of the fibula creates a small bump for muscle attachment, and the bottom creates the bump of the outer ankle, which is lower than the tibia on the other side. And the calcaneus bone that defines our heel will accept a strong muscle attachment. Not all landmarks will be seen at all times, but even seeing a few will give us the x-ray vision to find the bones below. With this x-ray vision, we will be able to construct the skeleton under the surface. This is especially important when we begin building realistic anatomy on our figure, since these landmarks will be where our muscles anchor to the skeleton. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to go to drosh.com for more information on these topics and many more. If you want to see more videos like this, like, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you for the next one.